when I was thinking about right, this morning, uh, I thought that uh, I was going to think uh, about one topic. But then, about three weeks ago, God just suddenly dropped this into my heart. And he says, and it's talking about conversations with God. And it was round about the thought that um, wherever we are, we can just be talking to God. We could just say, what a wonderful day it is. Or, oh, flipping it, Lord, sort this out for us. You know, he wants us to be realistic with him and, 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 and talk about how we feel. Uh, you know, he's, he's Father God and he wants our, to be our friend, our special friend, whom we can uh, just talk to and share everything with. And it's his deep desire for us to have a deep relationship with him. In Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9, God was walked in the garden, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And it gives you an impression that this is what it used to do. It used to go walking in the garden. they go and have a long chat with them, just casually. And that's just what he wants to do. He wants to have a, a, a talk with us, a chat with us. And prayer is a two-way thing. It requires you to listen as well as to speak. Listening to God is saying it, uh, uh, to what God is saying, is not always easy. It can take time to train, you, train yourself to really listen to what God is saying and to work that relationship out with him. Because in this world, we're always rushing about and there's things saying, what about this, what about that, what about the other? And there's a lot of things bombarding you. But to learn to t go to that place where you can just sit quiet, and to spend that time of God is really beautiful. When you were your friends, as I said, you, you just talk about many things, maybe TV, sport, places you've been or things you've done. Also, what's making you happy? What's making you sad or anxious? You talk and listen and reassure and encourage you all, all together as friends. And we can talk like this with God. We don't need to have any formal prayers or anything. God wants to hear what our heart is and to hear what's, what we're really thinking and just to talk openly. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not worthy. No, that's not for me. I don't want to know it. I don't know what to say. You do it with your friends. You talk casually with them and you, you open yourself up to them. So why not with your Father God? He wants that deep personal relationship. The Holy Spirit is also involved in these conversations to help us to understand God speaking to us and his word. In John 14, it says this, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of all that I have sent to you. So it just, the Holy Spirit is helping to teach you. It's helping you to understand what God is saying. And then, at the right time, it's reminding you of what is says of what is said to you, reminding you of you know God said, well, I promised I'd get you through this situation when you're really worrying about it, or oh, I just want to bless you. And in John 16, it says this: When the Holy Spirit comes, He will guide you to into all the truth. He will not speak on His own, but only what He hears. And then the Spirit joins with our prayers in the same way the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we don't know what to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Holy Spirit groans with us when we don't know how to pray or what to say. You, know, you might just be lost for words. You might just, you might just be saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. But the Holy Spirit knows and God knows as well. Conversation can come in general forms, from the gen, uh, like, like, how are we? What can, what are we doing? How we feel? Conversation can also have a discussion. We can do this with God. Well, what do you think about this? And, you know, is it, where do I go here? Or what are you wanting me to do today? And, and, you know, that's happened to many, many people in the Bible. And God just really helps us 
uh, at those times. And the Holy Spirit helps us through that as well. In Exodus 3, verse 11 to 4, Moses had a discussion with God when he called him out uh, to the burning bush. He says, who am I? The Israelites won't listen to me. I can't speak. I've got a stutter. You know, they won't listen to me. They, they don't know me. He asked God for help to talk to Pharaoh. But all this time, God was really encouraging Moses. And God sent his, his brother Aaron to help him in, in this work. In Genesis 18, 20 to 33, Abraham had a discussion with God about the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are two very sinful towns, and Abraham's nephew Lot was living there. So Abraham was concerned for his family and also the people of the town. And God revealed to Abraham that he was going to punish his towns. A long discussion follows. You know, uh, for 50 people, will you destroy the two towns for 50 people? No, if I can find 50 righteous, I won't do it. What about 40? What about 30? So it goes right down. What about 10? And God says, yes, for 10, I won't destroy it. In the end, there were only eight. Am I right, eight? I think so. Uh, so and so his family escape. Sadly, lost the wife, Lot's wife turned round and was turned into a pillar of salt. And then when Gabriel spoke to Mary, telling her she was going to become pregnant with the Son of God, she asked, how can this be? Gabriel explained to her the Holy Spirit would come on her and she would become pregnant. She then began rejoicing what she had been talked about. In Luke one twenty eight to 38 this is how it puts it. The angel went to Mary and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this could be. The angel said, Don't be afraid. You found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You have to call him Jesus. Mary asked, How can this be? And the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then in Luke 1, 46 to 49, she's now gone down to see her cousin Elizabeth, who's also miraculously pregnant, but three months further on. No, six months further on. Uh, and Mary said, this is what she said in these verses, the Magnificat. Mary said, my soul magnifies, glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, and from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. I've already said that in John fourteen twenty six, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I said. If you have any worries or anxiety, talk to God. Get alongside another Christian who can help and encourage you. Don't feel that God's not interested in you. Or I'm only small. Or I'm only weak. God is interested in every single one of us. If you're feeling under a heavy burden, talk to God. He wants to help you carry that burden. In Matthew 11, 28-30, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you feeling lost? The Holy Spirit will guard you. God is friendly and creative. Give thanks to God for all he's done for you. Thank him for his creation for the good things that happen. Telling him when you've had a good day or when good things happen. When and I frequently say, if uh, if a lot of little, little things are just adding up and saying, oh yeah, God's just blessing us. And we just say, God loves to give good things to his children. That's to each one of us. Talk with God as a friend. 
but he's better than a friend. His advice is true and will help you. He's our elder brother. Let your heart beat with his. How did Jesus interact with people? The woman at the well, he, he was loving and gentle, forgiving her, and the whole village was saved. The woman was a Samaritan woman the Jews despised. She was in sin. She had five husbands and now lived with a man who wasn't her husband. And Jesus said to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you, you'd have asked him for a drink. In verse 25 to 26, the woman says, I know that the Messiah is coming when he comes. You will explain everything to us. Jesus says, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. The Samaritan woman, this is a different Samaritan woman, she is asking for healing for her daughter. And Jesus at first refused because he said, I've come, to, I've come to the Jews. But as she persisted, um, Jesus was saying, you know, I've just come to the Jews. He says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the table. And he commended her for her faith. He was compassionate towards her and her daughter was healed. In Luke 7, 11 to 15, Jesus was walking through a village called Nain. And there was a funeral taking place. A widow had lost her son. And she was now all on her own. And Jesus had compassion. And he raised him to life, giving him back to her. So Jesus went up and touched the bear. And they were carrying him, uh, carrying him and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And he sat up and started to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was afraid of the Pharisees. Jesus had deep discussion with him about being born again. In John 3, verses 2 to 3, Nicodemus says, We know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus says, Very truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And in verses 5 to 6, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and the spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. And then in Psalm 139, which is one of our favorite Psalms, isn't it? When it says that God really knows us. We can be truly aware of this if we have a deep relationship with him. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and know me. You know when I sit down, and when I get up, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? This is just so wonderful. I mean, we, we, we've had uh, God just waking us up in the middle of night, particularly uh, when we've been uh, planning a trip to Africa where we've, we've gone seven times now. And God's just woken us up and just spoken to us at these times, hasn't he, when? Uh, and it's just been amazing. Or God will just drop something into our hearts in the middle of the night. And it's just so wonderful. But, but we're still practicing it. When God said this to me a few weeks ago, I thought, well, how often do I sort of talk to God through the day? Three, four at most? And I thought, no, I've got to learn this. So I'm just trying to practice speaking to God. Is all we have to do. You don't necessarily have to speak out loud. But wherever you are, God wants to hear you and to listen to you. And if you don't just feel God's presence all the time, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, remember, God hears you. He listens to you and will answer you. And all God's promises are yes and amen. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. Anyone got any comments or things to things to pick up on from that 
thinking when Lillian was talking that if you don't tell God your troubles, you tell yourself your troubles, and that's called worrying. So it's better <laughs> it's better to push them upwards. Wayne, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say, when Lynn went about God waking up during night, he woke me up first. I could tell his hair because I got a cool breeze come over me. Cool breeze. And I said to Lily and said, Get up, God's here. Yeah. Wake up. So she had to do it, hadn't you? Yeah. And God is the God of the impossible. Right? You know, because I was told. Uh, I, can't think of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I was told I never drive, I never swim. Hey, no, I don't ever. Uh, and I'm not intelligent enough to do well. Yeah. I've, I've, I'm not intelligent enough to do well, but with God, I've done all the lot. And a year ago, you know, he healed me of cancer. I didn't know I had it. God saw it and he clobbered it. And I don't have cancer and I've been discharged. And one time we were coming back from Corfu. We were flying over the, the sea to Italy. And the captain announced, I have an engine not working. I'm shutting it down. I've only one engine. So everybody got in a panic. And I just looked at Lynn and I said, God's got us up. He'll get us down. And when we landed, normally I like, see these TV programs where sometimes planes land and spin round and burst into flames. It was a very quiet landing. But there were people on the plane, hysterical. I just sat there as calm as out. Like, like in Zimbabwe, we've been seeing a lot of stuff out there. When we first went out there, we'd been planning. I wanted to go out there, I'd been dreaming about it. And God said, stop planning. Get on with your job. Go off. So we did do, didn't we? And we're short of airfare. I managed to get some airfare. We brought it off my mother. And then somebody comes and says, How are you doing for your airfare? So we said, Well, we're so much short. They wrote down, wrote a check out, so go give me more my money back. And then the week before we went out, we'd only £200 saved towards the expenses. We wanted six. Didn't we? So I went to church that morning. Somebody come to us, give us a roll of banknotes, and it was four hundred pound. And at the end of the meeting, George says, "We'll give you the offering to take out with you who's out there." So we went believing for four hundred pound. I got to meet his need, and he gave us seven hundred. So God is the God of the impossible. Our car breaking down in Zimbabwe. The car broke down. It wouldn't go. It kept the exhaust fell off first, so we tied it on the tree back, and then the whole, en the whole engine packed up, everything packed up. So then I said to Klopp, so "What are we going to do? Because we're out in the middle of nowhere. We got out to the car. We didn't know if there were rhinos, elephants, what were out there. So we got out to the car and I said, let's all lay hands on bonnet. So we laid hands on bonnet, and the car started, and it didn't stop till we got back to Klopp's house, house an hour later. Like, he ain't seen plenty of healings, haven't we? Yeah." And one lady we prayed for, she was uh, expecting a baby was like, wrong, wrong, lying the wrong way around. As we prayed for it, it turned around the right way. And people heal of heart attacks and that, weren't they? So, because it's impossible. And everything I do, you know, I know that God's there. And whatever I go through, he'll go through with